Hi, I'm Kevin Savitz. On July 25, 2016, I interviewed Bard Emmentrout, who was the creator of Rembrandt. Uh, Rembrandt was a popular Atari graphics program uh, subtitled the Atari Design Studio. Rembrandt was released in 1985 by Antic Software. Written in Valforth, it supported joystick, keyboard, koala pad, and Atari touch tablet for input. He also created an add-on solid, solid, solid object module, which allowed users to create Mode 9 geometric primitives to make what appeared to be 3D shaded objects. The predecessor to Rembrandt was a drawing program called Paint 10, which was unreleased. After the interview, Bard sent me a box of floppy disks, here are some of them, which appears to contain the source code for Rembrandt and some picture disks and the object uh, module. But so far, I have not been able to read any of the disks. It does not look good, but I'm still working on it. So uh, this interview is uh, for Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast at ataripodcast.com. I'm experimenting with uh, doing video for some of the interviews, and this is, this is that. Enjoy. When I was in grad school, there was all they they people were starting to get personal computers. I was in grad school from seventy five to seventy nine, and there were a bunch of companies that had make your own type computers, and I thought that would be really cool. And there was one that had really good um, graphics capabilities that were. And I'm bragging about, but it never came to be, and I sort of ignored it. And then I went off to do my postdoc, and and I I bought a VCS 2600, <laughs> and then um, I guess in maybe 80 1980 the 800 came out. At the time, there was the Apple. That was about the only thing you could buy, and. I don't know, for some reason I wasn't too interested in that, but having used the VCS um, for a number of years, I went ahead and um, bought my 800. I got the original 800, and I think I got one um, of their big disk drives. Maybe I got two disk drives. I think the whole thing was like a thousand bucks or something ridiculous like that. <clears throat> so I got that, and um, that's how I got the, the Atari and, you know, I wrote some crappy code in basic, but I didn't really like much like basic and there really weren't any languages around until I, um, then I discovered fourth, which, um, which I really liked because I've always liked HP calculators and everything in, um, HP is reverse Polish notation, RPN. And fourth was a stack-based RPN language, and that's basically um, how I got into fourth. Um, started getting things like the fourth interest group newsletter, um, and started writing programs in fourth just for fun. Um, I had a bunch of different little pieces of software, and one of them was... Um, the, there was a couple of paint programs. I think there was called Micro Painter and Micro Illustrator. And I, you know, they gave you four colors and I wanted more. And I knew that uh, they were all basically offshoots of rewrites of Apple code. And, and so there was graphics mode 10. All right. In the Atari, I think there was um, 9, 10, and 11 or 10, 11, and 12. And one of those was these were the special GTIA modes, 16, right? 16 gray scales with one um, one color, or there was one that was um, 16 colors with one luminance value, and that was mode 10, I believe. And so I wrote this program called Paint 10, <laughs> which allowed you to start to paint, and that's what eventually became Rembrandt. Nice. So, you know, so I, was, I was Paint 10 um, something that was um, distributed or was that? No, you see that? no, was just that, for your own use? no, I think I might have. I, I, I might. What, there might be a version of it in the box of this I'm sending you. So, so, cool. But but I don't know if it was even compiled. I, I, you know, it was my earliest thing. Um, so it sounds like I your goal. Huh? So it sounds like your goal with these was to create a graphics program that could use the 
antic modes that other programs were ignoring. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then I discovered all kinds of stuff like um, what are they called? Vertical blank interrupts and um, display list interrupts. They allowed me to do um, put a lot more color on there. But that's that, that we we can go into that in more detail whenever you're ready. Uh, so it was always it was really fun. I mean, I still write tons of code, and I have, but now all my code's available for free now. So <laughs> nice. Do you still use Forth? No, you know, like um, I, I I used to play with Forth because I don't know if you know there was these things called Sun workstations. Okay, they were big old Unix workstations, and the original Mac. Um, once they switched to um, once they switched to OS X in the early days of OS X, uh, both both of those their system monitor. If you went into the boot prompt and things like that, both for both of those computers it was fourth. So you could write little fourth programs right there. Um, they did you know the most you could do is list numbers and <laughs> do some crappy integer arithmetic. Um, Fourth is, was was I, I I think I had fourth on a machine for a while on an old IBM and it's really dangerous because you are allowed to actually directly stick stuff in arbitrary memory locations which is probably not a good thing to do <laughs> <laughs> in an unprotected OS. Right. <clears throat> but fourth itself was an inspiration for um, I I write code for solving large systems of differential equations and and doing bifurcation theory and stuff and i my my parser and compiler are all based on fourth and really fast so nice <laughs> so fourth still has for me uh, uh, uh fod memories so i'm curious about um why drawing programs are you an artist were you an artist no no, no. In fact, when I was a kid, I uh, I made a lot of movies, um, but they were animated. And like my real goal was to write an animation program. But um, and there is a little bit of animation in 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 um, Rambrat. You can draw a bunch of pictures and take little screenshots and then replay them as clips. So that was really sort of what I wanted to do was do computer animation and. You know, I made in high school a bunch of movies like uh, this one you can find on YouTube. I managed to get it converted off of the eight millimeter called Caramel Knowledge, which is a couple of caramels that um, take their wrappers off and have sex. And then <laughs> so. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was I was 16, I think. <laughs> I think it was um, 19. Yeah, it would have been. It was 1970 or 71, maybe. Nice. <laughs> but yeah, and I had a bunch of that. other ones with vegetables having sex. I mean, I was a teenager, so, and they were all stop action animation because I'm kind of, I can't draw worth beans. But um, my current differential equation software has lots of really cool animation features built into it. And I wrote a little scripting language so that you could take the differential equations and animate them and things like that. So, so I, I continue in that main. I, I cannot draw worth anything. Uh, okay. Um, even though I col I collect fountain pens, but I don't use them for calligraphy or anything. Just like the pens themselves. The I like the technology. It's very interesting technology, how they filled, how they, um, yeah, prevented the ink from squirting out. I mean, this is, you know, in the early 1900s, that was the prime time for this. And there were dozens of manufacturers. It's sort of like craft beer is to you guys. Um, oh, I lost the audio. Sorry. I lost your audio. Sorry. Do you have, um, are you at home or at work? Do you have a pen to show I'm at you? work. Yeah. Oh. Show me a pen. Yeah. Here's a pen. Why is this, this pen interesting? Oh, this pen's really cool because it is a, it's a 1940 Eversharp Walt Doric adjustable nib. And what's really cool here is um, the nib 
can go from a firm nib to a very flexible nib by adjusting this little bar on here. And because 1940 was when people just started flying as passengers in airplanes, it has a little device in here, which when the lid goes on, it blocks the ink flow, so it won't thump. And then it has a very cool filling mechanism that's based on a um, vacuum fill. So anyway, it's wow. it's a pretty cool pen. Yeah, nice. yeah. So, I like so that happens to be my pen to, of the day. Yes. Nice. Yeah, you mentioned the airplane thing. I, I like these uh, these big precise pens. They're not fountain ah. pens; they're just regular pens. But I can't take them on airplanes because I found that they tend to explode. They leak. Yeah, don't like that. Anyway, back to Atari. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. So you created the Paint Ten program. So would you say that was your first big project on the Atari? Well, I had that. I tried to. I I, I used to play around with. Fake. I, I I made a preliminary game based on the live, uh, Night of the Living Dead, but I never really. Yeah, you know, I I was looking all over for it. It was at you know zombies moving around, and you had to shoot them in the brain to kill them. And when they hit you, you would lose an arm or lose a leg and stuff like that. And eventually, if you lost all four limbs, then you were dead. And and it, you know, and you had a little gun. It was you know, and and it was all done with this um, player missile graphics and characters. So it was a pretty you know, you could in the Atari you can make fake character, you can make little characters and stuff like that. So I played around with that, and then I was also playing around. They had a really nice, um, they had a pretty decent music synthesizer. So I had this. Um, synthesizer where you could define notes by their attack decay sustain and release and and things like that and so you could just hit the keyboard and play different notes with that that was so another project but the the the, the um rambrandt oh, there's, there's my usb thing i actually have it running on this linux box here um oh you have an atari emulator running on your Device. Yeah, nice. then I have Rembrandt, and then I actually I, I destroyed at least three versions of it because, um, you know, the virtual discs. I would save a picture on the virtual disc, and I would forget that it was the original disc, and it would overwrite that. So, uh, but yeah, yeah. So, so Rembrandt sort of was in the end was I did all kinds of other things on the Atari. Tried to do some. Oh, one really cool thing. One project, which I never again, I, I, it was only for personal consumption. This is when I was at, um, once I got to Pitt, um, I wanted to be able to work from home. So there were terminal emulators you could use, but there were none that would mimic a, um, a Tektronix scope so that you couldn't get graphics. So I wrote a Tektronix emulator um, for the Atari wow. that, 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 uh, had really crappy little character graphics for the bottom part because everything was done in graphics mode, but, but it worked. I mean, I could get, um, I think 60 letters across the bottom and you could draw sine waves and crap like that. Yeah. So that was Neat. pretty cool. So is there any chance that that and the night of the living dead game are on the pile of discs you sent me? The the Tektronix emulator might be on that pile of discs, but I'm sure the Night of the Living Dead isn't because I can't find any evidence of it anywhere. Um, yeah, it was based on, you know, this is back you know, when I, I guess I moved to Pittsburgh and um, nah, maybe this is still, I was in um, at, at NIH in um, Washington, D.C., but, or in Bethesda, yeah, it was probably still there. But I was always a big fan of the zombie movies. And then when I moved to Pittsburgh, that was like awesome. This is ground central because George Romero was here. And one of the first places when my my um, girlfriend, who eventually became my wife, visited me, we went up to the Monroeville Mall to see all the places where the movie was filmed. That was exciting for me, not for her. <laughs> nice. Um, all right, so... So Rembrandt, um, so you created it, and it, um, when you did you submit it to? How did it get published? I mean, did you submit it to <coughs> okay, APX well, and then well, they or straight to Antic? How did that work? 
Pittsburgh Atari computer enthusiasts, and they were trying to publish it. You know, it's, it's, they 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 figured they could make some money off of me because nobody else there. They were all users. None of them were creators. So so they wanted to do it. And then um, apparently Antic seemed to be the best um, venue, and I think it ended up being published through Antic. I I probably made a few bucks a disc. From it, I don't remember too much of the details. It obviously wasn't how I made my living, um, but yeah. So I, it was published through Antic. I remember that, and and there were all these extra add-on modules because you certainly aware that the Atari had 48k in it. But there was actually I was looking. I found all this these discs, which I think I sent you which include code, there was apparently a 16K RAM add-on you could stick into one of the cartridge things. I can't remember what the name of the RAM was, but it was a RAM disk, and you could use that to store pictures too. So I, I, was, I supported that. I know I, when the Koala pad came out, I supported that, and same with the Atari pad. There were two different pads. In fact, I yeah. think in the opening screen for Rembrandt, you get a choice of which pad you want to use, <clears throat> or your and which graphics mode you want to switch to. I thought it was really yeah interesting. I mean that you got you supported the Atari Touchpad and the Koala Pad, or you could draw with joystick, or you could draw with keyboard, and then a bunch of printers. I mean, it seems like you went out of your way to make this. Okie Mate, the Okie Mate color printer. Yep, yep, yeah. That's that's right. I used to have one of those. I don't know where it is anymore. Um, with a kind of plastic ribbon-like stuff that would <laughs> it's almost like typewriter ribbon. <laughs> hmm. That's why I would really love you if you can possibly extract the some of the pictures off the discs because there was all these weird effects you could do by cutting, rotating, and copying, and you get these real weird fractal pictures. And there's a couple of them on there that I think I scanned from a newspaper because I built a scanner for the Atari, for the um, Rembrandt that was really, really cheesy scanner, but it worked great. And I, I've lost your I'm audio. Sorry, my fault. Um, did it, how, did, how did that work? How did oh, it that was, damage uh, the, okay. the joystick port? It's, it's not, not joystick. No, the paddle ports, which were A to D converters. And so you go to Radio Shack and you buy a um, photo diode, okay? And those detect dark and light. And a photo resistor, photo diode. And I, I don't remember the circuitry, but you just, it was only two wires that you hooked up to the paddle controller. And then if you move that around, um, you could read off the paddles, all right? Read off the paddle port, the values. So what you would do is, um, with a rubber band and a paper clip, jam it into the, the head of a dot matrix printer, all right? You remember the dot matrix printers, okay? And with sure. a dot matrix printer, what you would do is you would tape the picture that you wanted to scan onto the paper. Remember, they had the little holes on the side. Yeah, sure. And Perfect. you scroll it through there, all right? And then you get this thing, this thing starts to run. And what it would do is run across and put a dot at the end. You had to do that because the printers are smart enough that if it didn't have to go to the end, it wouldn't. And then it would course go back. It would, it would scroll back. And it was going back. At that point, you could read the, the data. Okay. So you send it, send it, print a dot at one end, print a dot at the other end, and, and line feed. So that it would just read the illumination, the illuminance, luminance, as it moved across there, scroll up a little and do that. And then that was converted into, um, I mean, that was converted into 16-bit grayscale that you could use on the um, mode 11 or whatever it was and scan a picture. Nice. There's a, a swimsuit picture. I think I've seen it in various places. It might have been used in Antics. Um, ad for Rembrandt of, of a woman in a black swimsuit. Mm -hmm. And that was a scan that I made. Wow. And <laughs> where, what did you scan it from? Some 
newspaper. <laughs> it was an ad for Kaufman swimsuits um, in the paper, but it was high contrast, black mm -hmm. and white or grayscale, and a woman, what else you want? Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Wasn't naked, so. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <clears throat> Built his own scanner. That's awesome. Um, all right, so. It was selling through the catalog, and you don't particularly remember how well it sold, it sounds like. Um, I know that there were reviews that it was really powerful, but really hard to use, um, because it had hundreds of choices, and it was all done through, um, you get, they had all had keyboard shortcuts, or you can move the mouse down and click on one of the, the, the words like plot or fill, or something, and I, I wouldn't have remembered this except that I downloaded it to play with, and I hadn't realized how uh, there, this whole keyboard shortcut, um, many commands, not really organized well, is sort of a, um, I guess that's a theme I have, because my current software is the same way. It's got tons, it's, it's, it's not easy for first time users, but once you get good at it, it's really fast, because it's got all these keyboard shortcuts which I live by. I, I will not use any editor but Emacs. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how much you know about Unix editors. Well, sure. I'm, write... I'm, a, I'm a VI man, but I, I respect okay. your, oh, I respect oh, your oh, choice. Yeah, like my neighbor down the hall. <laughs> um, VI, virtually imbecilic, yeah. Um, <laughs> now, I'm, I'm, I don't know why I picked up on Emacs, but eight megs and constantly swapping. Um, that was when eight yes. megs was a lot, but now. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, all right, so <laughs> the uh, you've got your your software, and then you made some add-on modules for it for Rembrandt. Yep, yep. Tell, there was the. Tell me about those. Let's see. There was the three D module, which is how all this got started. Um, a different Kevin, Kevin Brown asked me about that. And I believe I found some of that and it's going to be in the pile of discs. That was pretty cool. That was a module for shading, um, making 3D cylinders, spheres, and um, I think, and, and maybe tori. Um, but with, you could show, put the light where you wanted and stuff. And this is all in the little 8K that you had to swap out. So that was one of the modules. Um, there was a module for saving and reading and writing. And there was a disk operating system that I think MicroPainter and some of the other paint programs used um, with some compression. And I believe there was a module that you could read their, their paintings in and edit them and also write in that format. And I think there was also a module for a couple of the color printers like Okimate. Those are the ones I remember. Do you remember getting any feedback from users, any letters or anything? Like no, that? you know, I think there was just before email or anything. Um, I, you know, I don't think I ever get any feedback. I will tell you that, that, that I was an avid consumer of literature. There was a game by Chris Crawford that he put out that he gave the whole source code to it. And that was great because that had all kinds of cool tricks for um, manipulating various and sundry registers that were in the Atari. I mean, that, and, 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 and I wrote an assembler in Forth to use so I could do really fast stuff. I, I did a lot of the fast stuff like drawing lines and stuff. That was all in assembly language. <laughs> but... Um, and that I picked up, too, from, from various sources. Mm -hmm. I think there were some disassemblers you could get. And I remember disassembling some old Apple paint program to see how they drew lines quickly. Because I particularly needed that for the Tektronics, because there I was, I was getting things, you know, well, 300 baud <laughs> or 1,200 baud if you got the expensive motors. Right. So what, which was the Chris Crawford game that inspired you? Oh, I can't remember what it was called. It was like a... There was Eastern uh, Front. That was 
uh, Eastern Front. Eastern Front, Front. that's yeah. what it was. Yep, yep, yeah, yeah. And he made the whole source code available. That's the key thing. Um, I wasn't a big, I, I, there was a couple of games I really liked to play, but that wasn't really my thing. I was really more into programming, but yeah. I did really like Frogger and Jawbreaker, which is a Pac-Man clone. Sure, John but, Harris, yeah. I just interviewed him. I, I have a, I, 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 that's probably available, but that's in the pile of discs I'm sending you. Um, Great. Um, so what happened after Rembrandt? Did you work on new projects? Did you, or, or what happened next? <clears throat> well, I got the, I, I got the, what do you call it? The, um, the new Atari came out, the 16-bit machine. Yeah, one uh, of the STs. The, the 520 which? ST or the 1040 ST? Yeah, ten, I think the ST, it was a 16-bit one. Yeah. It was the one that was supposed to compete with the Apple. Um, well, that was the other cool thing is is right near the tail end of my Atari 800, the Mac came out. Um, the little, little box came out. Mm -hmm. And they had really cool pattern fills and stuff like that. So that's how like, Rembrandt has all these quilts and special brushes and stuff that were inspired by that because i didn't see any other paint programs with that but anyway so that was sort of that was the tail end of the atari and then i, I bought an st and i started programming in something called action this is a a language that they had i think it was called action i think it was the st it was by oss it was by clinton parker and it was a great language yeah, yeah, yeah. It really was. It was really nice. It fit into, there was a cartridge-based version of it. And I started to try and write a 16-bit program in, um, for painting because I figured, hey, I've already got Rembrandt. <clears throat> but ultimately, kind of gave up on that because other people were coming up and they had much better graphics than that. But the key thing with Rembrandt was being able to milk as many colors as you could out. I had some crazy ideas for, with the Atari 800 to get more colors. Um, one of them which worked but gave you a really bad headache. And what it did was it would, on the vertical blank, it would alternate two different color palettes so that you could have the same resolution as the four color stuff but you could have 16 colors because it was four by four. You could have your back palette and your front palette. Mm, so, so if you wanted like a, green, a, a flickering effect, it would flicker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it gave me a headache. So I never made that one. <laughs> that one never made it out of the, um, <clears throat> never made it out of the, the box there. Huh. So I bought the ST, but by then I was starting to program on, um, in, in C and other languages on real computers or, you know, regular computers. And I think I ended up selling my ST in order to buy a, um, this would have been, what was the ST? Would it have been late 80s? Uh, 85 is when they came out. Okay. But they, they continued to produce them, Oh, they right? continued until, right, early early 90s. Yeah, because I think around 88, I think I sold my ST and I spent, I bought a $2,000 laptop for, um, oh, I have here, hold on, that is still that, yeah, there it is, <laughs> the T1200. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Toshiba? It, it, Toshiba, yep, yep, yeah. yep, yeah. Toshiba, I think late 80s. And and I really hated DOS. Yeah. And, and this is pre-Windows. And so in like the early 90s, um, I was a very, very early adopter. I also had my office. I had Sun workstations. And early 90s, I was a... I mean, late 80s is when I no 89 90 is when I started to develop the OD differential equation software that that I'm now most famous for um, XPP and XPPAUD um, 
used by thousands of people and lots of papers and stuff like that. It's it's sort of a, a standard package for simulation and things like that that a lot of people use. But um, I was an early adopter of Linux, and I remember downloading 36 three and a half inch floppy disks on my son workstation that I used to install Linux in this Toshiba. But I had to write a driver or at least an X11 thing for the graphics because it wasn't supported yet. But um, So basically now I'm pretty much Unix and Mac. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good choices, even if you are an Emacs user. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> well, we know enough commands in VI that I will use that occasionally if I have to, because every program, every computer seems to have VI, although most places have Emacs too. So, so we were. Let's sort of transition into uh, what you do today. I understand you're a professor at the University of Pittsburgh, and you do something with nonlinear dynamics to biological problems. Please explain this to me as if I were a child. What you do. Uh, I can start right off. I'm interested in um, one of the things I'm really interested in is um, visual hallucinations. And in fact, my PhD thesis was about visual hallucinations. Okay. One always has to be careful about one's choice of prepositions. Because if you say, I wrote my PhD thesis on mescaline hallucinations, um, people will misinterpret it. Um, so I say about masculine hallucinations. So that was, um, what I do is called mathematical neuroscience. And I try and understand phenomena like visual hallucinations by modeling. Um, I try and dig at the computational mechanisms that give rise to these things. Like why do people see simple geometric patterns? And it turns out that you can show this mathematically that anytime you have certain kinds of networks, you get that. I've also done a lot of work on synchronization. That may be what I'm best known. In. Hallucinations and synchronization are two of the things I'm really well known for. Um, right now I'm involved in a big, multi-year, um, multi-investigator project on how animals use um, odors to locate and follow trails. So that's something that, you know, how does a dog find um, um, find a lost person? Mm -hmm. Or how does a, a mouse navigate a trail, um, an odor trail to find what it's looking for? How does a moth find its sex mate, you know? So mescaline is like LSD, right? Related. Mm -hmm. Mescaline is related to LSD, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all very closely related. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. So I was really and 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 I kind of gotten reinterested in that because there's a lot of um, there's there's ways to induce hallucinations that don't involve. Um, don't involve hallucinogens. Um, one of the things that's um, very cool is, is um, hold on, I'll see if I have it here. Where are they? Ah, um, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> flicker. So if you, um, <laughs> if you um, put on my LSD goggles here, um, let's see, on, off, switch. There we go. Um, yeah. Yeah. So if you strap these on, okay, um, then there, there we Scoot go. Scoot over a little bit so I can see and you in the frame. And they will start to, they will oh, start wow. to flicker. <laughs> so you've got these these goggles that with like LEDs in them flicker, that flickered all different colors. A whole field flicker, uh -huh. and as they're flickering through the whole field, your visual system breaks up into very cool geometric patterns. And these are called flicker phosphenes. So, written a bunch of papers on those recently as well. Neat. So that's sort of um, trying to understand the the mathematics of that. Another cool project is that if you look at certain high contrast stripes in your periphery, your visual field will start to flicker. And so, see, uh, so I have a project with a student on that um, where we're putting 
high contrast stripes into these networks. Um, that's got me into another type of computing now, which I've just sort of novel novice at, but GPU computing. Um, we can leverage the amazing ability that um, these games <laughs> have um, and do real hardcore highly parallel computations on them now. So I've been doing a lot of CUDA programming, which is for NVIDIA as well. I mean, for me, computing's a hobby. I like to do it. Coding's sort of like a zen. <laughs> I mean, my meat and potatoes is still, you know, paper and pencil and doing calculations, but <clears throat> inspired a lot by simulations, and that's fun to do. Nice. So I just have to ask, how much research do you get to do uh, with the with the LSD? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, that was all done when I was in college. Uh huh. The year nineteen seventy four. So basically, nineteen seventy four was when I did all my experiments with hallucinogens, but I haven't done anything since then um, other than, you know, you smoke a little dope now and then, but my preferred poison these days is mostly um, ethanolic, but um, no interesting hallucinations there. Yeah. But but um, the hallucinogens just lasted too damn long. Mm. I mean, it was... Um, yeah, it was a day before you were good for anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you could send a message to the Atari computer community that still exists, and you can right now, what would you tell them? Oh, man. Um, I will tell them to, to keep hacking. And, and really, what, what the amazing... I think everybody should start on a machine like this because these days you've got, you know, 10 gigs of memory or 32 gigs of memory. Um, you could be really sloppy and 32 K narrows your options and makes you every single byte count. And I guess that's a good metaphor for life, right? Nice. <laughs> is, is to use, use that 48K as well as you can. I mean, with Ram brand, it was, um, we had 48K, but the pictures themselves took 8K, and there was an 8K undo buffer, which means I was left with 32K to do 3D, um, multiple colors and stuff. And you can learn to be really, really, you know, and, and, and it's really a good metaphor for, for a general lifestyle. Don't waste anything. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Recycle, <laughs> <laughs> compost, <laughs> take advantage of that. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't is, know if that's the right kind of No, thing. <laughs> that's exactly what I needed. Uh, what haven't I asked you that I should have? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, um, let's see. We did pretty much all the hacking <laughs> and stuff on the Atari. Um, uh, bombs. We didn't talk about bombs. Bombs? <laughs> I made bombs when I was 15. What? That's why I have a hear. I'm deaf in my left ear. And I've that's why I got into math, because <laughs> it's safe. Tell me a story about making bombs. <laughs> oh, I'm, I was really into, you know, it was like the 60s. And so um, we started out making black powder and stuff, but then very quickly moved to fulminates and azides and things like that, which are azides, the stuff in your airbags. <laughs> so, and that was my undoing, lead azide on November 1969 <laughs> uh, and turned me around. It was sort of like my, my, uh, I guess, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, geez. Um, when, when you stop going in the wrong direction and you start going in the right direction, uh, put you on the straight and narrow. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Pretty much from then on, yeah. I, I was always a goody two shoes in school until I hit puberty, but for then the bombs and stuff were that was that was really interesting and fun. I don't really have to say I have too many regrets and didn't kill me. Um, and it makes for a lot of interesting stories. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so we we made a I'm missing fingertips and uh, hearing aid here, and um, I don't know. I was lucky I had glasses. Uh, <laughs> well, because I think coding's a lot harder if you're blind. <laughs> yes, but yeah, programming in fourth I think is probably safer than setting off bombs. Yeah, well, that was it, man. I <laughs> switched from I, I decided to be a math major in college, and that was it. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you, Bart. I think I have what I need. All right. Can you send me like a link to this when it's on or anything? Or? Yes, um, I will. It will be a couple of months before it's published, and I will let you know when it is, and uh, you can tell all of your friends. Yeah. Uh -huh. Can you? Um, you so I'm going to send you the, this box of discs tomorrow. Is that okay? Great. I mean, I, I, I look forward to it. I will rip. I have an Atari computer right behind me. I'll move them all into ATR files. You already have an emulator, so you can run them immediately. Oh, so I could get the – if you had the pictures, yeah. those are just plain disks, right, yeah. that yeah. you could read off of the emulator, right? Yep. Cool. Yeah. All right. <laughs> super. It should be super easy if the disks are still good, which yeah. they probably are. Yeah, I are, don't so. know how good they are. So you're a Mac person also? Yes, I am. Yeah, I do not use Windows. I don't like it. You still use VI on the Mac? Well, when, no, but when I'm using in a Linux situation, VI is my, my jam. My, my Mac is just all text windows. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <clears throat> yeah, I think on this one, I'm still back using 10.6 or 10.7 or something like that. Hmm. At home, I try and keep up with the latest so I can make sure my software compiles. And works. Sure, yeah. My... Uh... My main my main jam is really the Atari 8-bit, but I just got back from an Apple II conference in Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, where I it's a week long summer camp basically for adults that we play with Apple IIs, and wow. uh, it's a lot of fun. And I just got back last night, and uh, there I programmed my my first game in 6502 assembly language. So. Yeah, 6502 was an awesome language. Doesn't have too many commands, and it's just great. <laughs> yeah. What do you do? Uh, I, I I own a business that publishes websites. My company has a hundred websites or so. I see. Yeah. So. so you do you write all the HTML code for them or JavaScript? Well, well now I I have people to do that stuff, but I come up with the ideas for the sites, and I make sure that the content is the, of the quality that I want. So. Oh, cool! Yeah. Cool. Cool. A website designer. Yeah. Or uh, publisher. Is that what it is? Yeah. Publisher. So, yeah. yeah, I don't uh, yeah, I don't really know anything about that. I I I write crappy HTML and I had the first I had the first um page ever devoted to Popeye on the internet. Really? Yeah, That's... yeah. And there's still a lot of if you go to Popeye websites, uh, a lot of it's just crypt <laughs> plagiarized sort of uh -huh. like uh, Melania Trump's speech right from my <laughs> my Popeye website from maybe 96 or 97 wow nice yeah, in, That's a, the... I'm, I'm a world expert on Popeye nice the, the, the comic strip or the cartoon or both? The, the, mostly the um, okay the pre pre the 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 webs the, the the comic strip when it was um um LC Seagars and the cartoons when they were done by the Fleischer brothers who I totally adore and um, I've got some signed Betty Boop stuff and um, and some original Popeye cells that I nice um, the Fleischer brothers burned down and so there was very few cells out there but come by them on occasion. Very nice. Cool. Well, thank so you for yes, your time. Animation. <laughs> oh, right. Right back to Rembrandt. Nice, nice tying it all together. I like that. <laughs> cool. All right. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's been fun. Thank you. <laughs>